Hello! Welcome back to another Dragon Plus live stream. I'm your host, as always, Bart Carroll. I missed you all last week, but uh, glad to be here this week. My co-host, as always, is Jeremy Hopford. Actually, Jeremy was running slightly delayed, and so we had to stand in, although he is now here, but uh, that would have ruined my stupid bit. So he has graciously agreed to wait uh, until I finish my intro. Uh, we are at a new time, as you can see, for the new year. Dragon Plus, the live stream, has moved now to Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. We did some uh, finesse finagling with the schedule to shift a few shows around, and uh, our Tuesdays were getting quite heavy internally. So Dragon Plus will now be on this time moving forward, Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Uh, we'll also be looking forward to doing a few more giveaways more regularly. It was something that we tried to make a, um, a habit of last uh, year, and uh, we'll continue to do that moving forward this year. So next week, as I say that, <laughs> we'll start next week. Next week, please do expect some giveaways. We'll announce what those are in advance on social media. All right, we've got a quick little video. Uh, our D&D Rewind video that we'll be showing of uh, some key moments of recent live streams. And then we'll get Jeremy on camera and mic'd up. We'll be fielding your questions. We always say that we're collecting your questions for future live streams. This is the future live stream. We have them from past live streams written down and ready to go. Uh, and if you do have new questions, please do put them in chat. We are monitoring. Just please preface them with question. All right, we will be right back with Jeremy Crawford. You reported this to the city watch yet? I just found out. Well, <laughs> you're the captain of the car. Yeah, you better go report this. Yeah, this is idiot. Your job. What are you doing? <laughs> I hear everyone arguing, and it's going to make the pie taste worse. Look what I found. <laughs> this is Waterdeep. The real Waterdeep. The untold, mysterious, dangerous things that lie beneath it. That's the city. Not the splendor, not the bazaars, not the interesting people above, but the foundations underneath it. The combo rendition. Mm -hmm. But I also think as a dark horse, I think Solis. <laughs> 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 I, I I think Celise, I, you know, she she. I don't think she would admit it. Oh, Sharafka, you're so wrong. I don't think, I don't think she would admit it, but, but uh, I, no. I could just see her just uh, belting it out no. in full armor. Oh no! This is, just you all know this ain't never gonna happen. <laughs> No, you are so wrong. I also have the ability uh, to speak in any language with any creature ever. Wonderful. So, like, if you like me. Wow, really? Yeah, it's something called tongues. Tiene como cortinas, este, y pueden escuchar desde el interior como sonidos de alguien moviéndose y perciben el olor de hierbas aromáticas quemándose. Mm, aromáticas como las que encontraron antes o aromáticas como, <risa> como clavo y... no, aromáticas como, como pachuli o no sé, algo así como que <risa> cilantro <risa> no están haciendo pozole no sé <risa> yeah, I'm gonna jump down and look for him because people should not be going off alone oh and Mercy, Mercy screams when Mercy scream. your feet and his armored thud person like thuds out of the tray while I'm in the middle ah! of doing laundry. Ah! 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 <laughs> Raven friend upstairs. We had a, we had a talk. A, um, a bird, or do you mean you had a squawk? That's what it sounded like, anyway. Either way, it amounts to the same, doesn't it? Ugh. You have fallen so far, Rin, that now your best allies are birds. My best allies were birds for years. All right, we're back. A la peanut butter sandwiches. Jeremy Hopford has transformed <laughs> back 
<laughs> to Jeremy Crawford. Here, here I am, the non-Bunny Rabbit version. <laughs> lead rules designer of Dungeons & Dragons, lead designer of the Player's Handbook, and the game's managing uh, editor, uh, and uh, co-host of uh, the Dragon Plus livestream every other week. That's also something we wanted to make a bit more regular going through 2019. So. Appreciate your time and uh, ability to join us. I'm always happy to be here. Sans lunch, we were just discussing. So. Yes, I've not had lunch yet. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so last week you were out and about in uh, San Antonio, Texas. That's right. I was at PAX South, uh. where I DM'd my second episode of Acquisitions Incorporated. Tons of fun. Totally crazy. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't watched it yet, everyone, I, I recommend you do uh, just to see new heights of audience participation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I decided at the last minute to get the audience to chant blood, blood, <laughs> blood, and oh boy, did that, did that go over well. <laughs> and it was sort of terrifying. And, and hence memes are born. Yes. Uh, so you can uh, see the archive on the PAX channel, but we were discussing, we, I, I should have I uh, reached out to them to get the footage. We'll re-air that on this channel. Uh, be great, but before next time. So we're we're two episodes in with Jeremy Crawford as uh, dungeon master for the Acquisitions Inc. crew. So uh, congratulations! Thank you. Uh, I was asking you in advance last time. It, it, such a it's such a terrible question. Are you nervous to be doing this? And uh, it seemed uh, like you were you were handling it quite capably. And I can't imagine. How? <laughs> so it has always been for me throughout my life, and I, I started way back as a teenager. I started as an actor mm -hmm. uh, in high school and in college. Uh, I am always terrified the, the few seconds right before I go out on stage. But like 30 seconds mm -hmm. in, as soon as I start talking, I'm usually okay. But oh my God, those few seconds right before. Yeah. Uh, and then also, it's different for something like Acquisitions Incorporated because I'm not only performing, but I'm also creating the story in advance. Right. So that sort of 30 seconds before stepping onto stage gets stretched out <laughs> for a day, several days, uh, as I'm, you know, batting around different story ideas mm. in my head, uh, you know, trying to create a narrative that will be satisfying for a particular episode, you know, because I want it to be exciting, but also to end in a good spot, yeah. to then set up the next episode well. It's a really fun creative project. It's very similar to what we all do as Dungeon Masters with our campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, but with that added uh, twist of wanting to make sure it's entertaining <laughs> for the people watching it and not just the people who are playing uh, the game. Well, uh, we hope that you as the audience enjoyed it. It was uh, obviously something we're, we're very proud of you for, for taking part in and oh, looking forward to, uh, to continuing sessions. So where exactly was the party exploring by the end of it? They had uh, gotten themselves into a strange... <laughs> <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> so I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't watched the episode yet. Okay. But at the end of the episode, the At Kink crew, they... They realize, yes. and I allowed them to figure it out, <laughs> that they had been crawling through something that no one wants to be crawling through. <laughs> and that's all I'll say. <laughs> so please, when you see the episode, enjoy. <laughs> and as far as party composition, uh, one of the players was Xavier... Um, Xavier uh, Woods. Xavier Woods. WWE superstar yes. Xavier Woods. Yes. Uh, he was fantastic. Uh, I've DM'd for him once before at TwitchCon. Right, I remember. That was a, also a fun fun uh, show to watch. And, you know, I realized at the end of this Ack Inc. episode mm -hmm. that purely by accident, both of the episodes I have DM'd for Xavier ended up having black mold in it as, <laughs> as a piece of the story at some <laughs> point. Because the TwitchCon adventure I did, for anyone who didn't see it, uh, was all about Zugtomoy yeah. uh, sending fungus into Waterdeep, uh, essentially on Halloween, and it had been baked into a bunch of people's pumpkin pies <laughs> and uh, was turning them into her thralls. Uh, so p it was purely by accident that the second time I have I have Xavier Woods at my table, it's black mold again. <laughs> <laughs> and he was uh, he was covered in. Uh Cheese, was it? Yes. So his character, Bobby, yeah. uh, is 
just obsessed with cheese. So <laughs> yeah, he came up with this thing where his character is just constantly eating cheese and wants to be paid in cheese. So so <laughs> Omen, uh, head of Acquisitions Incorporated, basically struck gold by getting this powerful Goliath barbarian who mm. just wants to be paid in cheese. I can relate. I, I, I have no problem. <laughs> <laughs> you, you too would work for cheese. Don't let our boss hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had heard, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but the term soldier comes from when they were paid in salt because that was a relative rarity at the time or a, a more precious commodity. So possibly apocryphal, but right. that's where I'd heard the etymology of the Now I'm, I'm going to want to look that up yes. afterward. And you're going to look it up. It's going to be completely wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, but bar. Yes. No, it's actually a Latin term. It just means somebody who fights. Uh, so, hey, let's get to it. Um, let's, uh, let's actually address uh, some of the questions that you have. Uh, they've been coming in uh, pretty, pretty regularly here, and uh, we'll, we'll give some... some uh, some time to questions that you have asked in uh, the past. We have, really quickly, the latest Unearthed Arcana Sidekicks article is out. The uh, survey I, is, it might be closed at this point as far as feedback that has come in. Yes. Okay, so, mm -hmm. uh, but you can still enjoy uh, the Sidekicks article uh, available Here. on the D&D website. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. But I'm such a nerd. I have a dictionary on my computer. <laughs> the the word you're actually thinking of yes. is salary. Salary. Okay. There we go. <laughs> but but soldier does it come from this uh, salt factor into salary? Soldier came from just simply pay. Pay. Okay. Yeah. All right. But wait. Now let's look at the Latin salidus, which literally meant solid. Mm. So actually, a solid solid coin that you would receive for your payment. Oh, is that where it's kind of good? It was a gold from? coin of the later Roman Empire ah. because it, yeah, it was solid. Ah. Maybe buy, that's why you that's buy it. Under, it was an underdog who always bit the nickel he got yeah, for, uh, for shoe shining. Yeah, you want to make want to make sure your tooth your tooth doesn't go right through it. <laughs> 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 All right, let's jump to some questions. Uh, we're just going to go through an order here. Uh, we had a few on spells and magic. Uh, Eric Green too. Not the original, but the second Eric Green asks, can a College of Glamour bard use Mantle of Inspiration on themselves? Ooh, that is a good question. And let's see if I'm able to access D&D &D Beyond while they're doing maintenance. <laughs> 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 that would be great. I'm here. I was like, oh, I don't need to bring a stack of books because I can no, go to D&D &D Beyond. I was on D&D &D Beyond all morning looking up uh, monster stats. Yes. All right. Uh, so, the intention with Mantle of Inspiration mm -hmm. is that you're using it on uh, others. However, what matters is what is actually on the page. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look. As a bonus action, you can expend one use of your Bardic Inspiration to grant yourself a wondrous appearance. So you are fabulous. When you do so, choose a number of creatures you can see and that can see you within 60 feet of you, up to a number equal to your Charisma modifier, minimum of one person. Each of them gains five temporary hit points. When a creature gains these temporary hit points, it can immediately use its reaction to move up to its speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Okay, so technically, if you can see yourself, mm -hmm. you can use this on yourself. Okay. Yeah, and give yourself five temporary hit points and immediately use your reaction to, to do a little shimmy uh, across the battlefield or whatever the floor is the, or other surface that you're on, and you do so without provoking opportunity attacks. All right. So yes, by, by how, how it is written, inspire yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm paying you a compliment, it's a bardic inspiration. Oh, uh, there you uh, go. That's, that's not good. <laughs> 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 AFK Ninja asks, Cloud of Daggers is a concentration spell that lasts up for up to one minute in an area. <laughs> oh boy, we, we're getting into the weeds with this one. Uh, da -da -da. Cloud of Daggers is a concentration spell that lasts for up to one minute in an area, five, a five foot cube area, doing damage when cast and at the beginning of each turn. Uh -huh. If I were to an enchanted dagger with this spell as an impact spell to save a spell slot, whew, 
Would it work as a single hit spell or would it work as a concentration spell? Ah, uh, so this is this is really a question that goes beyond what the spell does. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, this isn't a rules question so much as a homebrew question. Okay. Uh, and so if you want to enchant a dagger with the spell, it sounds like essentially what the person wants to do is have a dagger that maybe you throw. Right. Uh, and then on impact, I'm enchanting this dagger. The mm -hmm. spell is contained in the dagger. When I throw it, does the spell just go off, or am I still concentrating on that? So or the cloud of daggers. So, are. so typically with with a magic item, uh, well, it actually depends on the type of magic item. For many magic items, uh, we will we will waive the requirement of concentration, mm -hmm. uh, especially if. Uh, you're like hurling something out, there's an explosion, a spell effect takes place. We often don't require you when we design such a magic item mm -hmm. to concentrate on the effect that the item is creating. Right. This is in contrast to a magic item like a wand or a staff, where really uh, in the narrative of the game you're kind of channeling magic through it. We will often require you to still concentrate on spells you cast mm -hmm. from that item. Uh, so I would say you could certainly design a magic item where you hurl a dagger, uh, this cloud of daggers go off, mm -hmm. goes off, and you could make it so that the caster does not uh, have to concentrate. And I like the uh, concept of this as a magic item as well. You've got a, a thrown dagger with cloud of daggers mm -hmm. sort of enchanted into it, which is uh, it's a pretty cool idea for yeah. uh, AFK Ninja. Uh, I'm going to jump into the uh, the chat really quick because uh, A for a palate cleanser because that was uh, <laughs> uh, uh, a, a, a deep one, but also because it was related. Uh, do you have, I'm missing the question right now, but do you have a particular favorite home-brewed magic item that you might have made over the years? Let's see. A dagger that clasps a... Right, right. <laughs> you know, not really. I, so, and I say that because I spend most of my home-brewing energy when I'm not just coming up with the stories that my players are going to face, I tend to spend most of it on monsters. Mm. Uh, and mm. this is even true for me as a game designer. I just love designing monsters. Uh, magic items, uh, rather than creating additional items like the ones you can already find in the Dungeon Master's Guide or whatnot, I tend to create, uh, when I'm homebrewing, uh, like magic vehicles. Mm, mm. Uh, I love like magic buildings uh, that have all sorts of interesting magic goo on them. Um, so it's because I feel like in, and again, part of this is because I work on the game, I feel like we're pretty darn thorough when it comes to portable items with fairly narrow uses. And so usually when I'm just making up crazy things for my own game, I want to go bigger. Yeah. You know, why create the wand when I can create, you know. The wand factory. The, the, the wand Gatling gun <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> or I can create, you know, an airship that can, you know, slip through dimensions mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, do just really go big. Right. Because that's the beauty of homebrewing is you can go way beyond uh, what's in the rules, partly because you as a DM get to then control the use of that thing you created. Mm -hmm. uh, there's none of the worries we have as designers of like, oh, if we let loose this bonkers thing on the entire D&D community, what is it going to do to everyone's table? Right. Whereas as a DM homebrewing something, I only have to be concerned about what happens at my own table, and if things start going sideways, I can course correct. Uh, and so that's why I like to go really big um, I'm also a big fan of home brewing uh, special like pieces of furniture. Uh, and <laughs> that's not where I thought that sentence no, would go. No, no. I, so I love, uh, inspired by the kinds of things you find in fantasy literature mm. or folklore, I love having like, you know, the magic throne that you mm. can sit in and it allows you to scry the entire kingdom uh, or, you know, a a pool that has been blessed uh, in a druid grove. Mm. Uh, and if you gaze up into it, 
uh, you can't see actually the present or the future, but you might be able to see thousands of years in the past. Mm. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. I, I love to inject magic into the environment, mm. uh, into the buildings, into vehicles, uh, into, you know, having massive uh, statues and whatnot that might have magical properties, that kind of thing. Basically, the theme is what you're hearing is I like to go big. Go big, yes. Yeah, <laughs> go big. Uh, so when you say buildings, do you mean portable buildings or just buildings within your campaign uh, that they can visit? So, so what I mean there is when I ponder a world of magic mm -hmm. that has access to all of the wondrous things available in D&D, &D, not only the spells but the magic items, and then I expand that to the architectural level. You can imagine the particularly wealthy people in a D&D &D world would integrate magic into the building itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that there would be uh, statuary that, that is keeping guard. Uh, that you know a door might be built so that it will allow uh, only members of the family to mm -hmm. pass through it. Uh, you know, the, the stairs leading up to the master bedroom uh, might collapse into a slide if, ni if the person going up is neither of the people who belongs in that bedroom. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, especially when I'm, when I'm DMing and I'm creating environments where I think, okay, these people are immensely wealthy, they were spellcasters themselves or had, you know, spellcaster companions. I would like, I like to put in mm. uh, things like that. Um, and I enjoy that actually even more than creating traps. Traps make sense when a place has been basically armed against intruders. Mm -hmm. uh, but often when you're talking about a place that people live in, I, am, I often actually chuckle when like people live here, yet there are spiked pits. You know, it's like, <laughs> dear God, better hope you don't slip. You right. know, in the middle of the night when you go downstairs to get you know a glass why of milk. I put this here? Yeah, why the heck? <laughs> why did I put a spiked pit <laughs> on my way to the kitchen? And so, if especially if it's an environment where people live, you know, it might be a castle, a manor house, uh, even a temple where maybe the attendants of that temple live nearby. Mm -hmm. I like to instead think about, rather than traps, think of magical mechanisms that those people might have put there for their own convenience, mm -hmm. uh, for their safety, for their pleasure. Uh, that's the other thing. Uh, I love coming up with ways that people in D&D &D worlds are using magic and using magic items as entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't have TVs, they don't have video games, but by gum, they have magic. And they would do all sorts of things with it to amuse themselves. Do you I'm, I'm trying to phrase this in my mind correctly. Is it challenging to keep the game setting set in sort of that medieval fantasy feel, even when you have magic that can provide sort of pseudo-technological advancements? So D&D &D has actually always had a little bit of science fiction sprinkled into it, mm -hmm. going all the way back to first edition. Not only did you have laser guns in the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, as right. we've talked about before on yeah. this show, <laughs> yes. uh, but so many of the books that influenced Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson and their friends who helped them create D&D, so mm -hmm. many of those books were from the 1960s and really showed a blend mm -hmm. of uh, fantasy tropes and science fiction tropes. Even uh, Three Hearts and Three Lions, a book by Pal Anderson, sure, yeah. which a lot of people think of purely just as a fantasy book. It's the book that gave us the D&D Paladin. It's the book that gave us the D&D Troll with its regenerative abilities. But what's easy to forget is that book actually starts with the main character in our world mm -hmm. uh, in what was the present day at that time. Uh, and he gets transported to this other world, which happens to be what we would think of as a fantasy world. Right. Uh, you know, that, that is just true over and over again for a lot of uh, the inspiring material. Uh, the, you know, Zelazny's Chronicles of Amber, mm -hmm. while fantastical, also a lot of it takes place in a modern setting mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the things we would associate with the modern age. Uh, you know, there are old D&D &D adventures where people travel to Earth. Um, and so to me, it's actually totally natural for D&D &D uh, to have some of these things sprinkled in. Uh, and also, I would say, even at, at a technological level, D&D &D has tended to uh, hover around sort of a, 
an imagined version of the High Middle Ages or Early Renaissance more than it's actually been firmly parked in the Dark Ages, mm -hmm. uh, because there are there are enough things that pop up in D and D in terms of fashion and items. Uh, even some of the weapons that are used are actually um, High Medieval or Renaissance weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has always actually been a bit more of a Renaissance game than a uh, medieval game. Uh, now that said, many DMs, and myself included, have often done games that are thoroughly medieval. Uh, you know, where I, I, for the sake of the aesthetic that I'm trying to create, don't have uh, some of these other things. Um, whereas in contrast, in my current home game, uh, my gothic horror game that I've mentioned before, uh, I very purposefully uh, not only include sort of what some might call magitech, mm -hmm. I also, because of the real world horror literature that I'm nodding to, <laughs> I purposefully even include some sort of vaguely 19th century elements mm. in it. Uh, and the thing is, is if you, if you just keep the story engaging and whatnot, players will often like not even notice. Uh, they're like, wait, wait, are we on a train? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm definitely a fan of Magitech myself. Yeah. I mean, obviously we, we did the, uh, the Powered Armor and uh, Lost Laboratory of Koalish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Inspiration from, from Gene Wolfe and uh, from many other authors that sort of blended the, uh, the two, so. Yeah, and, and if people love that version of fantasy, yeah. of course they can go to Eberron mm -hmm. for basically a giant gallon of ice cream of that kind of <laughs> fantasy. And that's one of the things I like about Eberron is, you know, uh, you can, if you like airships mm -hmm. and magical trains and, and all of that, well, Eberron gives that to you in spades. Sure. I was a warforged for many a year in, yeah. uh, in the campaign, so it's good good times. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's jump ahead. Uh, we have a question here. We'll, we'll jump to uh, Natraya147. How does the blur spell interact with combat maneuvers since they use skill checks instead of attack rolls? All right, let's go to the blur spell. I'm playing Try to Stump Jeremy. <laughs> I like that game. <laughs> it, so I'm going to just start asking questions that have no uh, connection to D&D, but no, just questions I, don't, I can ask. No, I don't like that. I like it when they are actually legitimate D&D <laughs> &D questions. Where does the word soldier come from? Yeah. <laughs> well, but they, yeah, see, that's easy to bait me because... I am such a word nerd. Yeah. I'm like, ooh, let's look that up. Words are fantastic. Yes. Uh, all right, so the blur spell. For the duration, any creature has disadvantage on attack rolls against you. That's it. Okay. So it means if a person is uh, making ability checks against you, uh, blur, or, or, or you're making an ability check uh, to avoid something, blur doesn't do anything. Uh, and uh, this, is, this goes to an important principle uh, involving our spell design. Spells, as well as class features and feats mm -hmm. and other sort of very carefully crafted uh, game elements are intended to just do what they say they do. That said, DMs are encouraged to allow creative use of the spells, but please no one get dragged into philosophical arguments at your table uh, that like a spell like Blur is meant to apply to ability checks. Because mm. I can tell you, as the lead rules designer, if we meant this spell to apply to <laughs> ability checks, the spell would say it applies to <laughs> ability checks. Uh, and, and the reason why I say that is actually, please don't mishear me, it doesn't mean you can't make it apply to ability checks. If your group wants to do that and the DM is fine with expanding the spell's profile, go for it. You're not doing anything wrong. What I'm saying is don't waste any time trying to convince each other the spell says something it doesn't. Uh, and don't waste any time arguing about, well, the designers really intended this even though there's no hint of it <laughs> in the text. Uh, Basically, just be honest about what's in the text, and if you want the spell to do something else, then your group can decide to do that and be on your merry way. Uh, and, and that, to me, is, that is always the principle. And it's one of the reasons why I like to be so clear about what the text does and doesn't say. Mm -hmm. Not because any of us are bound by it, 
it's so we don't waste any time basically arguing about phantoms. It's like, let's talk about real things. Right. <laughs> one of the biggest arguments I have in my game, one of my players is a lava child. And it's so, uh, what can... Wow, I am sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can they or not interact with because of the, uh, the, the metal uh, oh, difficulties? Oh, right. So it's like, can I pick this up? Can I pick that up? Can I open a door? Like, oh, boy. Lava children. <laughs> one, one of the greatest horrors ever unleashed on Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, for anyone who does not know what a lava child is, please Google it, <laughs> and you will get to see what looks vaguely like an adult in in diapers with curly hair, an unflagging smile, yes. and suspenders, uh, <laughs> and nothing else, uh, they, wearing nothing else at all. They appeared originally in the old Fiend folio, and they've reappeared since in uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, I believe. Yes, and, so. and and I have to confess, they are there largely because Chris Perkins and I have joked about Lava Children for years. <laughs> and then also Sh uh, Sean, the concept artist, mm -hmm. he also then got in on it. And so basically we joked our way into having Lava Children in that book. My player thanks you specifically because <laughs> now they have it. Uh, Lazorn asks, I'm jumping in the chat now. And again, thank you for asking your questions. If we don't get them to, the, uh, to them today, we, we, we do wrap them up and we will. There's the lava child on screen right now. Oh so. my goodness. Sean gracious. Woods. Uh, yes. Complete with diapers and suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> and crazy uh, Freddy Krueger knife. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Lazorn asks, do you have any tips for running high-level caster monsters? Uh, one major gripe I face is I usually pick the spells from the spell list, but I know by heart and ignore 90% of the rest, but I feel like this makes the monster lesser. So any advice for running the complexity of a high-level uh, monster who is also a spell cast? Uh, great question. Um, what I would recommend is partially to continue doing what you're doing, which is use the spells you know and like. Uh, that There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we have designed our spellcasting monsters to give you as the DM total flexibility. Uh, there isn't a sort of a... A, a golden path hidden inside that spell list that you're supposed to follow as a DM. Uh, if we feel a monster really needs to perform a particular way, we forefront that in the monster uh, in the narrative text. We might tell you, hey, it always casts this spell, or it's in the monster's actions. Um, we give you that long list to give you a menu of options as a DM. So I would say use the spells you want to use. Uh, a lot of those spells are there to inspire you uh, as much outside combat as inside combat. You will notice most of our monsters, at least in official D&D books that have long spell lists, many of those spells are actually for outside combat. Uh, one of the reasons, in fact, why we do spell lists in our monsters is, pardon me, to show uh, that these stat blocks are meant to be more than just sort of combat programs. Mm -hmm. They're also... Uh, a set of inspiring bits that you can use to enhance uh, a social encounter. Uh, it might also inspire you as a DM to see how does this, uh, this spellcaster uh, operate in their day-to-day -day life? Mm. What, what are they doing in their community or in their cult or with their minions or you know whatever their, whatever passes for their community? Uh, what are they doing with that magic when they're not fighting adventurers? That's, that was the old joke. I need to move apartments. Do I cast strength or do I cast charm person? <laughs> and get the other guy to move my furniture. <laughs> right. That's, and that says a lot about you. <laughs> right. right. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I would say, uh, again, follow your bliss on what spells you want to cast. Look at a lot of the list as just there for inspiration. Uh, I, when I'm running high-level monsters, I gravitate honestly toward <laughs> the spells that are easier to use at the table, mm -hmm. uh, unless uh, I really, really want a more complex spell for a particular aesthetic reason. Here's an example. If I'm DMing and I have a monster who can cast Fireball in combat or Evard's Tentacles, mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, I'm going to cast Fireball. <laughs> I love those tentacles, <laughs> but that spell is usually more complicated than I want in a breezy fight. Yeah. But if I am setting up a set-piece encounter where those tentacles 
uh, are going to give the Lovecraftian mm. ick that I really want, yeah. then that's when I'm going to use that spell. But I'm not mis-DMing that monster all those other times when I don't use that spell. Because again, that list is really there to be the DM's friend and to be, again, a menu. Those two great spells. I love both of those. Yeah, they are. Fire, fire, fireball. They uh, are both fun. Where did this one go? Only because, uh, well, in part, um, because I love the, the name Evil Sales Ass <laughs> asks, can you cast, and I also love Dimensions Within Dimensions, can you cast Leoman's Tiny Hut with an eight hour dur duration inside the extra dimensional space created by Rope Trick? And what would, <laughs> what would happen at the end of the Rope Trick's one hour duration? All right, so okay, now this is, this is gonna involve me looking up two different spells. <laughs> I, All right, so I have on my screen Leoman's Tiny Hut. I, I just, I always love the bag of holding and the portable hole. Yes, and the, da, da, yeah. Da. So, and, yeah. The, and this is, these interactions are such classic d and I mean, it just goes back to first edition of how, how can we mix all of these different crazy things and see what happens? It's like looking up a rule with the book inside of D&D Beyond. How <laughs> is this going to interact? <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, so. Since what you want to do is create the hut inside the extra dimensional space of Rope Trick, I'm first looking at Rope Trick. Uh, all right, which, by the way, if you watch the most recent episode of Acquisitions Incorporated, you will see a very uh, uh, winning use of Rope <laughs> Trick. All right, so you've created this extra dimensional space. You can climb up your rope to get into it. Uh, all right. And while you're looking that up, I'm uh -huh. looking through some more of uh, your questions as well. This space can hold as many as eight medium or smaller mm -hmm. creatures. I was pausing because you will notice that in Rope Trick, we don't actually give you physical dimensions for it. It's mm -hmm. meant to kind of be fuzzy. You're in this weird extra, extra dimensional space. Right. Uh, but you can, if you really want to, like if you're playing on a grid and you actually want the, the space of the rope trick on the grid, uh, you could, uh, you know, basically take, take uh, eight five-foot squares and put them together uh, to create uh, this space. Okay. All right. So, uh, Leoman's Tiny Hut, a 10-foot radius of mobile dome springs into existence. So... It is small enough, if you translate what Rope Trick says about its space, yeah. it is small enough to put Liam and Tiny Hut into it. So here's... So, but then the question was, what happens when Rope Trick ends? And you're still inside the hut. The hut is still in existence when the Rope Trick right. expires. Right. Where do you go? So... Uh, I love this question. <laughs> so, creatures and objects within the dome, when you cast the spell, can move through it freely. Okay. So you can leave this dome yeah. and exit the extra dimensional space. Even though Rope Trick has expired? You, you're just going to pop out into uh, to where, where you would normally pop out to. Oh, I see. Okay, got it, got it. So the question is, since I mean, the hut lasts longer than the extra dimensional space, of Rope Trick. what happens when the extra dimensional uh, that the, the rope trick door has closed. Oh, so and that, I'm still in this. Wow! Hut. Like how, how the how See, do I, I get out of here? I was having so much fun imagining the extra dimensional space <laughs> and you creating essentially your pillow fort <laughs> inside <laughs> it with using Leoman's tiny hut. Right. That that I that I really missed the heart of the question. Well, and this that is a pillow is, fort in a pillow fort. Right. <laughs> so when your Leoman's tiny hut pillow fort <laughs> is inside your rope trick den and the rope trick expires, what yeah. happens? Okay, my friends. This is an easy one. Mm. Here's the very last sentence of Rope Trick. Anything inside the extra dimensional space drops out when the spell ends. Okay. So there you go. Okay. Next question. Why is there not a spell called Pillow Fort? I might have to do that in one of our upcoming books. <laughs> Jer Jeremy's Wondrous Pillow right. Fort. Like, trust me, it has to be in here. Don't ask any yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, uh, here's a one from uh, the archives. Uh, Jeradak asks, as an arcane cleric, can I use Spellbreaker to hit someone with two Cure Wounds? All right. So I'm going to look up Spellbreaker. 
Uh, and there was another, there was a great question as well coming uh, that was, uh, doo -doo -doo. I'm gonna I'm gonna miss it exactly, but it was also can you cast levitate while falling to save yourself? All right, first I'm gonna focus on this one. As an arcane <laughs> cleric, can I use spellbreaker to hit someone with two cure wounds? Here's what spellbreaker says: When you restore hit points to an ally with a spell of first level or higher, you can also spend one spell of your choice on that creature. This level of the spell you end must be equal to or lower than the level of the spell slot you use to cast the healing spell. Uh, so um, Spellbreaker is letting you end a spell on the person, not cast a second one. Okay. Yeah. So effectively, it, doesn't, it just doesn't work. No. How about the, uh, can I cast Levitate while falling and save myself? So this really depends on uh, how long your fall is. Uh, the basic rules in the core books basically assume falls are just instantaneous, mm -hmm. in which case you're splattered. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is in contrast, by the way, to Feather Fall, which is it's a reaction spell. Mm -hmm. It's actually designed to be cast in that split second uh, <laughs> as, you, as you are falling. Whereas Levitate uh, is um, not a reaction spell. Uh, instead, you have to spend your action to cast it. Now, the reason why I said in the basic rules a fall is considered to be instantaneous is because if you have Xanathar's Guide to Everything, we have an optional rule for falling that takes into account very long falls mm -hmm. that could end up lasting um, maybe several rounds, in which case you could then cast Levitate while you're falling. So really, it, it, it's up to your DM uh, whether the DM wants to uh, add in that extra bit of gameplay texture of having long falls lasting for a longer time. Or your DM might just go for the simple, a fall is instantaneous, again, in which case Levitate's not going to save you. All righty. There was a great uh, the old one-page dungeon contest, uh, which has been run for many years and I, I, I'm infatuated with. That was one of the dungeons was essentially you're falling through a bottomless pit. Mm. And so there are encounters along the way, which I thought was very, uh, very clever as well. Uh, that, that reminds me in the, uh, some video games often do that in reverse. Like the, uh, the most recent God of War, mm -hmm. there's a point in it where you're basically you're not falling, you're going up an elevator shaft, mm. and you just essentially just ride this elevator as different encounters come to you. <laughs> uh, where did that one go? Question from Grand Pyromania. If a monster suffers from massive damage, double their hit points, but has a trait indicating they can only die via a specific method, i.e. fire. Oh, wait, where is this question? Does massive damage override their trait? There's a trait indicating that they only die via a specific method. Um, so this is the kind of question w that I am hesitant to answer uh, because it's not referring to anything in particular. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't like to answer hypotheticals. Uh, so if... Grand Pyromania? Uh, if, if they have a specific monster they want to ask me about, then I'm happy to, to uh, address that. All so right. let's, let's do another question. Grand Pyromania, if you're in the chat, throw the monster in the and, chat. And the reason why it's true both, both on this show and uh, on Twitter, I generally avoid answering hypotheticals. It's because D&D &D does not have sort of like this unified theory of how everything is supposed to work. And it's, you know, it's not a physics engine. It's D&D has a fairly narrow set of general rules that a DM is meant to be able to use to improv with, and then it has many exceptions built on those general rules, and those exceptions just govern themselves. And we do that because we don't want anyone to be bedeviled by some massive set of, like, here's how the whole universe works, and have to use those rules and have all basically every game of D&D grind to a halt as you, as you figure out, you know, velocity and mass, or, <laughs> or whatever whatever physics problem it is someone is trying to solve. They, they got back to me with the one that I thought they were going to, which was, you've got a troll in your game. Uh -huh. It gets splattered, massive damage with a rock, sure. but it's a troll, and it can only be killed by fire. Then, you know, could it still be splattered with a big rock falling out, or some, some such scenario? Okay, so 
here's, so if, we, if we're going to use the troll as the example, here's what we're told. The troll regains 10 hit points at the start of its turn. If the troll takes acid or fire damage, this trait doesn't function at the start of the troll's next turn. The troll dies only if it starts its turn with zero hit points and doesn't regenerate. So in D&D, the specific beats the general. Okay. And the massive damage rule is a general rule, and here we have the specific troll. But let's also, <laughs> let's also look at the massive damage rule. Because sometimes a general rule doesn't apply in the way we might think it does if we're just going off our memory of it. While you're looking that up, have you ever killed a player with massive damage? Uh, you know what? I have not in 5th edition, but I have in previous editions. <laughs> in 5th edition, uh, I have killed characters yes. just by other means. <laughs> it, it, it didn't have to go through massive damage. Uh, I've, had, I've had people die with uh, failed death saving throws. Uh, I think I had someone disintegrated. <laughs> No disintegrations. That's my worst Darth Vader yeah. impression. Yeah, so looking here. again at the instant death rule, the troll's, uh, the troll's exception overrides the general rule. So it'll be smushed, but it will reform. It'll regenerate. It'll yep. regenerate and that is, that is part of the horror of the troll. Mm -hmm. uh, going all the way back to uh, the Pal Anderson novel. I was just, yes. Yeah, where, the, where <laughs> the troll is horrific. It, where... Uh, you know, in the novel, they, it has the limbs that, you know, you hack mm. them off and they keep coming at you. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, which is a great kind of zombie combination, mm -hmm. too. Like, yeah. Oh, you can kill the body, but it, like, it will not stop. It will still go. Yeah. It's relentless. <laughs> uh, Ravenan asks, uh, do features that modify the attack action with additional movement, such as blade fl flourish or distant strike, allow you to take the attack action to close in on the enemy for the first attack. All right, let's look at Blade Flourish. And, and by the way, again, it's going back to that, let's always talk about concrete things in the game. Mm -hmm. um, the way we design the game, there are not abilities like Blade Flourish. <laughs> there, there is, is blade just flourish. Blade Flourish. Uh, <laughs> now, we might design something else that is reminiscent of it, but they are not actually like swimming in the same rules pool. Yes. They just govern themselves. Uh, and if you get into that mindset of not being tempted to have the things bleed together, mm -hmm. it actually makes it so much easier to adjudicate the game. Uh, where Because you're not distracted by, well, what does that spell over there do? Like, you don't have to worry about that spell. Or you don't have to worry about that feature. You only have to worry about the one you're using right now. All right. Uh, blade Flourish. Here we go. So, whenever you take the attack action on your turn, your walking speed increases by 10 feet until the end of the turn, and if a weapon attack that you make as part of this action hits a creature, you can use one of the following blade flourish options of your choice. So the question was, uh, can you take the attack's action to close in on the enemy for the first attack? Mm -hmm. Okay, so at least in the case of blade flourish, what it tells you is when you take the attack action, your walking speed increases. So for, to get that walking speed increase, you have to actually take the attack action. Uh, this is important, and sometimes I, I get timing questions uh, like this. If any ability tells you doing X lets you do Y, X has to happen before Y. One of the reasons for that is D&D doesn't have an action declaration phase. Uh, they, like, basically the system almost basically doesn't care what your intent is. All the system cares about is what actually happened. Uh, part of the reason for that is, for that concreteness, is remember the game has reactions. Your turn at any moment in any combat could be interrupted by something a monster or an NPC does that suddenly deprives you of your ability to take an action. Imagine a monster taking a reaction that incapacitates you before you can take your action. Well, if that happened, and let's say you're like, well, my intent is to take the attack action, therefore I in I'm, going to, I'm going to get this speed increase in advance. 
but then you're you're whacked by something that makes it so you never even take the action. It means you never actually did the thing that was the prerequisite for the thing you wanted to do. Right. Uh, and so that's why in D and D, what really matters to the system is what actually happens, not what you intended to have happen. Uh, we are getting close to the top of the hour at uh, 2 p.m. I was going to ask you that one. Uh huh. Uh, it's kind of a fun. Oh, see. Yeah, let's. Uh, so, uh, we'll ask a couple more questions from, from the chat live. We've got a couple written down from the archives. Uh, and then again at 2 p.m., remember, we'll be switching over uh, to D&D &D Beyond to uh, the continuation of their live play game. But uh, before that, we'll ask uh, PDT276 asks, is it possible that multiple ritual casters could work together in a friendly and cooperative fashion? on a spell to either speed up the time it takes or to increase the spell's power? Uh, that is certainly uh, something you could explore. Uh, it, is, um, it is not something we have baked into the rules, but it is a fun idea. Uh, and it is something I've allowed at my table as a DM. Um, I basically, if, if multiple people are able to cast the spell as a ritual, uh, I've done things like shave a minute off for each extra person, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, so I would say just roll with it, DM, and experiment. <laughs> uh, you're not going uh, you're, you're to break the game anytime you experiment. Remember this. You're not going to break a ga the game in any way that you can't fix. Because remember, at your table, you're the final adjudicator. And so if something does blow up, well, you also have the ability to put it back together. Uh, and so I, I, and for me as a young DM, that was one of the most important lessons to learn is to mm. not be afraid of things going bonkers. Because <laughs> just as the DM was able to create, help create the craziness, the DM also has the ability to rein things back in. Yes, going bonkers, that, those are, again, you will remember those moments, I think, quite often as opposed to, uh, we've, it went swimmingly. Everything went according to plan. Like, yeah. no, no, I like, I like it when things go a little nutty. Either uh, of the uh, by the way, I do appreciate that someone in chat has rightly identified that I have Tintin's hairstyle. So, well done. <laughs> 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 uh, but which, by the way, uh, my barber insists on me keeping. I've told him over and over again, you can change my hair. And he says, no, I like it. And, <laughs> like, I've been going to the same guy for years, so he insists on making me look like Tintin. It's better than Captain Haddock? Is that the other? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. There we go. Yep. <laughs> uh, either of these last two you want to touch in uh, the written form? Uh, let's see. When will we be seeing the new Unearthed Arcana? Uh, we announced the, the new Unearthed Arcana will come out uh, next month. It's going to be a new version of the Artificer. Oh, uh, all right. So we're, we're, we're going ahead. We're, we're saying that now. Yes. All right. Yes, yes, yes. New version of the Artificer. Uh, it may not be on the second Monday next month. It will definitely be in February. But okay. we, will, we will unleash it into the wild when we're ready uh, because uh, we want to make sure it's in a state uh, that is going to help you all then give us great feedback on it. Uh, and so that's why we're taking our time with it. Uh, we know especially people who have the Wayfinder's Guide to Eberron and have been playing in Eberron are eager to have uh, an artificer. So we want to make sure we give you something nice and juicy to sink your teeth into. I've been looking forward to that myself personally. Again, kind of going back to our conversation on Magitech. I think that stuff is awesome to include in the game. Yeah. Uh, going bonkers, I love my fantasy settings that do go bonkers in, in various ways and taking players through times and settings and, and, and flavors. So Artificer will be super cool to see. And if anyone has been watching uh, my Acquisitions Incorporated games, and if you like uh, the gnome NPC Vi, Vi is in fact an artificer, mm. if you are wondering what's going on with her. Well, she's not just an artificer though, because <laughs> uh, she is also a planeswalker. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll kind of end, I think, on a couple of announcements. So as, as Jeremy has said, look for the new Unearthed Arcana to come out in February on a Monday, but not which Monday. It, it, might <laughs> right. be, it might be later than the second Monday, but it will be out in February. Yes. Uh, so we'll, we'll all eagerly look forward to that. 
The next issue of Dragon Plus uh, will also be out later in February as well, uh, which will pick up the Unearthed Arcana. You can look for it uh, there as well, as well as uh, some previews of other things that will be coming out throughout the year. Uh, so look for the next issue of Dragon Plus, issue 24, I believe we're on, uh, already coming out February 20th or possibly shortly thereafter. Uh, again, please do stick around. We'll be switching over to D&D Beyond. Looking forward to their continuing campaign. Uh, Dragon Plus, this live stream, we're going to remain at this time slot, Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, kind of shifting the schedule around in various ways. Mr. Crawford, not Mr. Hofford, but Mr. Crawford will be joining us every other week, and we appreciate the time out of your busy schedule. Um, but this is always a delight for me to be able to have these conversations, and I hope useful to uh, the, the you as well to have s some of your questions addressed. So, And next month we'll get to talk about the Artificer. That, I imagine, will be a very uh, in-depth conversation with many, many questions. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> about that. Uh, all right, we've got a couple of minutes here, but we will uh, bid adieu. And uh, oh, one quick mention as well, we also have a couple of uh, new shows. Speaking of schedules shifting around, Kate Welch will be starting her show up uh, Thursdays. I believe we're starting tomorrow, actually. Yes, so tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific, look for Kate Welch live streaming. And Mike Merle's The Happy Fun Hour, uh, he is off for a few weeks. He will be returning later in February. Uh, and again, his show has also changed time from Tuesday when he was the lead into us. He's moving to Thursday. He'll be leading into to Kate Welch. So look for him there. Uh, big shout out to, uh, to Satine Phoenix. Uh, she keeps track of the uh, calendar online, the Twitch calendar week by week. So it's very much appreciated. Thanks, as always, to everyone for taking an hour out of your time to watch. Thank you to our followers and subscribers. Thank you, as always, to our moderators. Thank you to Mr. Crawford for joining us again. And thank you to Pelham for running the production side of things. <laughs> and terrorizing us with love of children. <laughs> we'll be back next week. We'll be back in two weeks with Jeremy. And uh, we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>